Good afternoon. I'm Lara Natale, Director of Tech, Media, Telecom and Mobility at the Centre on Regulation in Europe, known as CER. And it's truly my pleasure to welcome you on behalf of Access Partnership to this panel on balancing fundamental rights in data protection. We have some 90 minutes this afternoon. We could certainly take considerably longer as there's so much to explore when it comes to our chosen topic. Um, noting, as you'll see also, that some of the crucial contexts in which balance is sought in fundamental rights and data protection are very much evolving and sometimes front page news. Um, so Access Partnership on this occasion publish a great investigative paper that will help root and springboard this discussion. Um, and we propose that we kick off with a succinct presentation of the paper before opening out to an interactive panel and I will introduce our speakers in a short while. Uh, the author of the paper in question is Lena Kusniemi. Uh, so Lena, good afternoon. You are a technology lawyer focused on data and privacy matters and a visiting fellow at the European Centre on Privacy and Cybersecurity at Maastricht University Faculty of Law, as well as a member of Helsinki University Legal Tech Lab Advisory Board and the IAPP. You're also, of course, special advisor to Access Partnership, and most importantly for the purposes of this debate, author of uh, our fundamental rights papers, and we're looking at whether they suffer from unequal remedies. So, uh, Lena, I thoroughly enjoyed delving into your work while preparing for today's debate, and I think in seeking to examine whether we have equal recognition and equitable enforcement right by right, could you please, um, Lena, talk us through how you approach the challenge, and we'll use your finding as grounding for the panel debate we've prepared and introduced our distinguished speakers at that juncture. So viewers, um, you have the opportunity to submit questions to Lena and indeed all our panelists by following the instructions on the banner you will see on the screen. Uh, also emailing the email address rsvp at accesspartnership.com with a subject like webinar. I will start to take these questions after our speakers have all had the chance to intervene at least once. Uh, if your in, in question is in, addressed to a particular panelist, panelist, please be sure to let us know, likewise, who you are and who you're representing. Thank you very much. And uh, Lena, right, definitely time to hear about our investigative paper. Thank you so much and over to you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and also warm welcome from my behalf. I will be talking short about this article and some of you may wonder that why haven't you seen it yet and that is the reason is that it has been available for the panelists but it will be publicly available in the coming weeks. Um, the starting point for this article was that we were talking in the small group and wondering why there isn't more public debate about the collision of fundamental rights and freedoms and how they are actually treated and what are the remedies available for individual citizen because even though my guess is that most of the audience is working in the organization whether commercial or non-profit we are all also private citizens and it seems that there is no lack of conflict if you're looking at the news but uh, this of course comes from my very lawyer background and i sometimes think that the news are kind of in the sad state, it kind of just brushes the very um, surface of these topics and never really discusses what is really at the stake. And if we are thinking about the latest development, especially in Europe, um, we do have unfortunately this pandemic and there has been a bit more discussion around the possible conflict between protection of data and having the data available for the research. There's also the access to the uh, data and uh, information for the citizens versus secrecy laws and protection of some uh, fundamental uh, issues where the society doesn't want to make them publicly known, at least not yet. Then, of course, we are talking about the freedom of expression and the personal privacy and honor of certain people who might be uh, subject or targets for very severe criticism. So a few words about the scope as such. So we are talking about the Europe. There are, of course, global developments and global trends, but we needed to do a little um, uh, fine tuning because, like Lara already said, this topic is vast and it's very huge and it has very uh, deep impacts. 
Um, so we tried to uh, come up with some concrete examples and I really didn't know where I ended when I started the research. Some things that I did find quite alarming uh, alarmingly was also what Lara already mentioned, that there are very, very different remedies available for the citizens depending which fundamental right they feel that they have um, uh, been subject to some injustice or they've been uh, denied of a certain rights or freedoms. And uh, very shortly mentioning what we are talking about in the paper, are the very kind of extremes where either you need to do no personal investments in time or money. I can simply file in a complaint versus that you need to finance a court trial that may last up to seven to nine years, where at the very end you may reach European Court of um, Human Rights. So um, I'm looking for the very lively discussion tonight and uh, with these panelists, like I said, who have had access to this paper and some of them have been kind enough to comment and contribute some ideas. But the article is only a starting point. I raised up some questions and topics and our panelists will uh, go much deeper uh, based on their own personal experience and their background what I think is a fantastic mix of different uh, topics and scopes. So uh, thank you from my behalf and I'm looking forward for a very lively discussion. Thanks. Lena, thank you so much. That's fantastic stimulus to center and springboard the discussion to follow. Uh, and you've raised many great questions already. So definitely time to introduce our panelists. First of all, we have Jan Oster, Professor of EU Law and Human Rights Protection at Leiden University. Good afternoon, Jan. Thank you so much for joining us today. Good afternoon. Good afternoon to you too. We have Emma Lanzo, Director for the Free Expression Project at the Center for Democracy and Technology, known as CDT, and member of the Freedom Online Coalition's Working Group on Privacy and Transparency Online. Good afternoon to you, Emma, or good morning, perhaps, in your time zone. Thank you. We also have Alexandros Ioannis Karkopoulos. Uh, may I please call you Alex, if that's okay for the of remainder of the discussion? Of course. Thank you so very you. much. Good afternoon to you, Alex. Alex is a program officer and seconded national expert at the EU Agency for Fundamental Rights and judge of first incidents in Greece, specialist in data protection or criminal justice and fundamental rights. And we also have Heidi Benson. Good afternoon, Heidi. Heidi is researcher at Oslo University, academic affiliate at the Center for Health, Law and Emerging Technologies at the University of Oxford, and member of the UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Privacy's Task Force on Privacy and the Protection of Health Data, known as Meditas. What a great multidisciplinary panel indeed, as Lena alluded to. So I propose we make this in light of all the fantastic speakers we have as interactive and responsive a session as possible, where we hear from all our panelists multiple times. So as a first intervention, I think it would be great if we could gain any standout reactions on Lena's contribution, while also exploring this crucial and evolving, and I agree with Lena, under discussed question of collision, maybe at times even collusion of rights uh, in both recognition and enforcement frameworks. So Jan, you have stated a keen interest in media, information and communication and European law, and you've written extensively too on media freedom as a fundamental right, to give an example of some of the different rights at play here. So what are your thoughts on Lena's paper and on balancing rights as above? Over to you. Thank you very much, Lara. And thank you in particular also to Lena for this very inspiring paper, which I had the privilege of reading beforehand. One very important aspect that Lena identified is the problem of legal uncertainty in the online environment, especially when it comes to the protection of fundamental rights. Legal uncertainty is good for lawyers, but it's bad for business. Where does this legal uncertainty come from, specifically when we look at fundamental rights protection? Fundamental rights are principles. They are principles that do not give us a clear code, a clear algorithm, but rather fundamental rights are principles that require a balancing exercise. And this makes it so unpredictable 
to foresee how a court will decide on the balancing in the case of a collision of fundamental rights. So what has to happen? Perhaps it might be a good idea, rather than using the principles of fundamental rights, to implement these fundamental rights, to codify these fundamental rights in a legal code, in a conditionally structured legal code with clear-cut if-then sentences. So the fashionable paradigm nowadays is law is code. We structure the law like an algorithm. And if we structure the law like an algorithm anyway, we might even think about implementing, enforcing the law by a machine. Perhaps machines, perhaps digital technology can help us enforcing, implementing the law in a digital environment. That sounds quite tempting, doesn't it? So rather than making breaches of the law unlawful, we make breaches of the law technically impossible. When something is uploaded, say, on, an, on a digital platform, the algorithms will identify, is this content lawful or is it unlawful? And if it's unlawful, it will be blocked. This is now very much in a nutshell, for example, the model of the recently uh, adopted digital, or so recently implemented DSM directive, Digital Single Markets Directive. Again, I think that sounds quite tempting, doesn't it? Rather than merely making breaches of the law unlawful, we make them impossible. So within the context of this paper, we might, we might now speak not just of privacy by design, but really of privacy by algorithm. The algorithms protect our privacy. But is this, this brave new world really as good as it sounds in the first place? I would actually like to raise two objections. One objection is of a more theoretical nature. The other one is of a very practical nature. First, the theoretical uh, objection I would like to raise. Are breaches of the law really such a bad thing? That might be a, a strange question to ask for, uh, for a lawyer. But nevertheless, we, I think we should think about this. Can't there even be a public benefit in breaches of the law, in making breaches of the law actually possible. Here is what I'm hinting at. There is an academic debate going on about the question whether there is something like a feedback mechanism to the legislator. The more breaches of the law we actually observe, the more we create a feedback to the legislator that the legislator might actually have to rethink this law in the first place. I mean, think about it in the past. There have been forms of speech, for example, sexually explicit speech or blasphemous speech that were partly even criminalized in the last century, but that are nowadays decriminalized in many countries, especially in liberal, liberal democracies. So don't breaches, doesn't the fact that we enable, that we actually permit breaches of the law to be physically, to be technically possible, doesn't this create a feedback mechanism for the legislator? So, for example, in a couple of years' time, we might have to rethink data protection. We might have to rethink privacy. We might have to rethink copyright. But we might be prevented from doing so if there are simply no breaches, for example, of copyright out there anymore. The second reservation I would have is of a very practical nature. And that's about the algorithm itself, or to be more specific, that's about the legal code itself. How do we have to structure the legal code in order to let it operate in the online environment? What if there are flaws in the legal code in the first place? Allow me just to give you one example. And that's, of course, the famous, or some would also say the infamous, right to be forgotten, established by the European Court of Justice in the Google Spain decision in 2014. Here, the Court of Justice actually turned the tables a bit against, against freedom of expression. The Court of Justice decided that material that is considered no longer relevant has to be removed unless there is an overriding public interest. So the onus is actually on the audience, on the speaker herself, to demonstrate that there is a public interest in this publication in the first place. 
I find this highly problematic as far as freedom of expression is concerned. And I would actually very much like to reconsider this doctrine on the right to be forgotten as established by the Court of Justice in the first place. So to conclude, I think there is a good argument in favor of legal certainty, structuring the law in enforceable codes rather than in these abstract terms that we know from fundamental rights protection. But we must always be careful what exactly the law says and is the way the law is then structured compatible with fundamental rights in the first place, such as the right to privacy and also freedom of expression. I look forward to our discussion. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Jan. Uh, I think you've given us so much food for thought to take forward, especially your visions there of enforce of the future of tech law for a start, but also of uh, auto enforcement with the counterfactual as well and feedback and learning by doing for legislators as they enforce will particularly come into play with some of the more EU level enforcement we're seen to set to, we're set to see on, to, on tech laws as, uh, for example, I'm thinking of the Digital Markets Act and the Digital Services Act currently under negotiation to name but two instruments. And um, I think that might be a good segue as we come to Emma. Uh, and Emma, in your uh, formidable tenure, in fact, at CDT, you've been leading on legislative advocacy transatlantically, focusing on the protection of fundamental rights to the freedom of expression and development of content policy best practices with online internet content platforms. Of course, as I just mentioned, EU efforts here are evolving by the day with uh, the Digital Services Act negotiations. So welcome to, to today's panel and let's hear from you. Great. Thank you so much, Lara. And, and thank you all um, for the opportunity to talk with you today and especially to Lena for the, the excellent paper um, that I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, being out in the world so that all of the participants can read as well. Um, I did want to talk a little bit about um, the, the Digital Services Act and in particular uh, it, the approach that it is currently taking in draft form to one of the topics that, that Lena mentioned in her overview of the paper, um, which is this whole question of researcher access Access to data that is held by private companies um, or by other kinds of institutions. Uh, and in the paper, Lane actually uh, talks through a very interesting and I think useful example um, coming from the experience of fin data uh, in Finland. Um, so in, I'll do a very quick summary of, of what's covered in the paper, um, but the, the short version is that in Finland, a, um, a specific act was passed that was aimed to facilitate the effective and safe processing and access to the personal, social and health data um, for, for research, uh, both medical research, research among doctors um, and in patient care and for public health. Um, and the goal goal was to facilitate that research while also guaranteeing an individual's rights and freedoms um, in the processing of their personal data. So all very good, uh, very good intentions. Um, but one of the main critics of this law and the new fin data process that was established is the Finnish Medical Association, um, which recognizes that the intention of the law and the whole process that was established was to facilitate research, um, but the, the FMA is asserting that the safety of patients is now under threat um, and that the kind of fast collection and sharing of information that they were previously able to do is prevented by the new laws and strictures um, put in place by, by the new regulation. Um, it's, there's also a lot of concern that um, there may be a real chilling effect on research that is happening, um, that research is maybe not being conducted at all, uh, or that it is happening much too late to be of any particular use in a given case, um, or that it will really just start happening in ways that intentionally circumvent the, the very processes that are intended to safeguard um, patient privacy and then the security of that data. Um, there's also a, a sense that maybe the structure uh, limits the academic freedom of the researchers, that because of how they have to define precisely what data they are looking for and, and kind of the purpose that they're going to use it for, um, it, it almost sort of requires them to already know the outcomes of their research before they can even conduct their research. And there's not that same ability to just sort of freely examine a data set and see what it is that they can see and, and find whatever insights that they can find from that data set. Um, again, because of the, the structure in the law intended to protect the, the privacy of very sensitive information for, um, for patients. 
And I think that, so I, I share this example from the paper because I think it's, it's such a great illustration of some of the kind of core of these questions and a very concrete way where this whole question of the balancing of fundamental rights um, and the balancing of different incentives is playing out very concretely in uh, policy debates right now. Um, so at Center for Democracy and Technology, we are doing a lot of work on this topic on both sides of the Atlantic. Um, and my work in particular focuses on freedom of expression online and most of the conversations in that area really have to do with data held by social media companies in particular, and sometimes other user generated content sites other, other web hosts, but a lot of the focus is on social media sites like Facebook and YouTube and Twitter as people try to get a better sense of what is going on on those platforms, how are they shaping our online information environment, what effects do their algorithms, their ranking and, and promotion of content have on different groups and communities. Um, and we've really seen just a kind of real acceleration of interest in this topic following the um, the leaks from Francis Haugen uh, in the what was covered in newspapers as the Facebook files or the Facebook papers, um, really kind of exploring and demonstrating just how much research there is to do on the effects and the operation of sites like Facebook and, and YouTube and Twitter. Um, so as we look at this question of examining research or access to data held by private companies, we see a couple of really key questions where a lot of these different sort of rights balancing issues really come into play. Um, one of the first and most important questions in any of these initiatives is, who may have access to whatever this data is that's held by private companies? Who is a researcher? How is that defined? Is it defined as someone affiliated with a particular definition of academic institution? That's a popular idea, a popular concept that comes up in, in many different proposals because there's the sense that the, the institutional review board or the ethics board of an accredited university is sort of the proxy for vetting the researcher and establishing that this researcher is legitimate, they are who they say they are, the work that they're doing is generally within the bounds of the research that is expected. Nobody wants to have another Cambridge Analytica situation on their hands, so there is very much the sense that there has to be some gatekeeping as to who gets to have access to this data. Um, but that a very narrow definition of researcher can leave out people like journalists and civil society advocates, human rights advocates, um, other people who are trying to do some of this exact same kind of analysis and evaluation of what is happening on these platforms, trying to contribute to broader public understanding and policymaker understanding of these services. Um, and they may be excluded from some of these definitions um, if, if care isn't taken. And then on the flip side about access to this data, you have questions about whether and if at all it's appropriate for, for different government actors to have access to information. Um, in the Digital Services Act, for example, there is uh, there was a provision requiring companies to make available any data that's necessary for the enforcement of the Digital Services Act um, and make that data available to digital services coordinators or the European Commission um, who shall use it for no other purpose in, in the language of the DSA. Um, that makes sense on one hand um, to you know try to facilitate the actual enforcement of the law but but the <laughs> prohibition that the data shall not be used for any other purpose may feel somewhat weak if it's really just written out as a single sentence with no other kind of safeguards or surety that for example law enforcement or intelligence agencies or any other kind of um, aspect of the government that's looking not actually at enforcing regulations against the platforms, but trying to find out more indiv information about individuals um, may see these kinds of, of routes to accessing data as a way, for example, to circumvent um, lawful process requirements. Uh, and then, of course, there's always this question of, do companies need to make data available to their potential competitors who may start out as researchers and through their research decide that they have a better idea of how to solve a problem or how to provide a service, um, or who may, in fact, just sort of pretend to be a, re a legitimate researcher, um, but who is really trying to identify information for, for competitive value. So there are all sorts of complicated questions like this that, that really kind of pervade any sort of approach to enabling researcher access to data. I'll just mention a couple of places where we're seeing some of these um, ideas come up in the Digital Services Act. Uh, there are for example, a number of different transparency reporting obligations that would apply to um, to all online service providers and then kind of increasingly um, stringent or detailed requirements that apply on larger and larger 
categories of, of online service provider. Um, the goal with the transparency reporting obligations is to make data completely public, right? And so that could enable researcher um, researchers who don't need any kind of permission or vetting by anybody to just access data that has already made completely public. Um, but there are also uh, very specific proposals around data access. Um, it's in Article 31, Data Access and Scrutiny, where very large online platforms would actually have to make much more specific data directly accessible to vetted researchers that um, the digital serv uh, a digital service coordinator has vetted, identified that they're affiliated with academic institutions, independent from commercial interests, have a proven record of expertise, and can meet privacy and data security standards for the data. Um, I think one of the big questions, and then then I'll, I'll pause because I, I know we have other great speakers who should come in. Um, one of the big questions that kind of suffuses all of these questions about researcher access to data, though, is this trade-off between what are the really necessary privacy and security uh, restrictions that need to be put around this data, whether that's transformations to the data in the form of differential privacy or aggregation and de-identification of that data, and then what do those kinds of transformations or other privacy protections actually mean about the kind of research questions that can be asked, and ultimately, will useful research that is kind of part of an overall legitimate aim of, of governmental regulation, of enabling better understanding of how platforms work to inform public policy or to enable a kind of watchdog or oversight function um, for online platforms, is it actually possible to do that kind of research based on the, the decisions that are made and the answers that are given to the question of privacy protections? Um, so I flag this as a really important and very concrete issue that is getting worked out as we speak in, in new amendments and changes to um, the proposed Digital Services Act uh, that are coming in pretty much every day at this point. Um, and I really look forward to digging into this and other questions with the rest of the panelists. Thank you. Emma, very many thanks. Um, we'll certainly be hearing more. You, you talked about researcher access in the healthcare context, uh, to which you alluded with the FinData example. We'll be hearing more, more about that too when we get to Heidi. Um, and noted too on your overview of accelerating interest in examining research on privately held data. Uh, and we uh, certainly have more rounds of interventions to follow on the enforcement side there. Just to mention on Lena's paper, as you've heard, a few panelists uh, allude to obviously having read it comprehensively. Those registered to the event should have received the paper by mail, but it will be made publicly available in the coming weeks through the Access Partnership website. Um, and now seeing as we've talked about enforcement um, quite a few times already, let's go to the enforcement agency view. Uh, and, and we have Alex with us, of course. So Alex, with your very rounded set of experience, you told us uh, as we were preparing this debate about your personal Venn diagram of expertise, if you like, looking at personal data, security and criminal law, and the Fundamental Rights Agency's Data Protection Handbook could provide us with insights on our discussion question. And I understand as part of this First intervention, you'll be briefly presenting the main findings of application of that publication. Thank you very much in advance. Uh, thank you all. Uh, first, I'd like to thank, uh, thank you for this uh, invitation we have here as an agency. Uh, by reading Lena's paper, uh, had uh, Lena's paper indeed brings forth many uh, important issues and uh, contextualizes. Uh, a lot of important, uh, the, uh, two important debates on the issue of data protection. The first is the uh, conflict of data of the right to data protection with other rights, and this uh, uh, so desired balancing exercise that, that the courts and other actors uh, call for in the application of personal data protection uh, in practice. And also, Lena's paper touches upon the enforcement of fundamental rights and uh, diverging. Uh, different speeds of enforcement within uh, different settings of uh, different national settings, especially. And we, as FRA, first, I would like to uh, briefly talk uh, about uh, uh, to describe what we do as an agency in the EU and also uh, on the initiative on, uh, based on the Lenin's paper. I'd like to present you some of our main findings in relation to the arguments that the paper brings forth. Uh, we, sorry. Uh, we, as, a, as an agency, what we do, 
uh, is that we actually advise uh, the EU institutions and EU member states on the practical application of fundamental rights in practice. What, how do we do that? We collect actually legal and socio-legal uh, information and evidence from the EU member states and based on that we build our reports and other uh, policy papers and, uh, uh, and handbooks. Uh, we as an EU agency, we, our work relates uh, uh, our work is confined to the competences of the EU, inevitably. So our main uh, instrument, main legal instrument of reference is the Charter of Fundamental Rights. But we also take into account also the European Convention of Human Rights and the case law of the European Court of Human Rights, as well as other international human rights instruments which are binding to member states of the EU. Uh, our work is freely available on, the, on our website, so you can get free uh, free digital copies or even hard copies from our website. Uh, also, other we also issue legal opinions on uh, proposed legislation, and we also publish the annual fundamental rights report, uh, where we explain the main trends, uh, do, uh, the main fundamental rights trends uh, throughout the EU uh, during the uh, reference year. Now, uh, first, uh, taking. Uh, uh, by using as, as an um, as an occasion the uh, what uh, other other discussions have already touched about the reception of uh, personal data uh, protection by individual citizens, which we actually pay to, uh, we as an agency pay much attention to that. Uh, and also, would like to inform you that in you know, 2020 we delivered uh, we should, we published uh, a report uh, uh, based on the fundamental rights survey uh, on the experience of. Uh, private individuals of their experience of data protection and privacy issue. Uh, the fa our findings uh, suggest uh, indeed that most people who, who's, who use the internet are quite uh, concerned of whether the personal data uh, can, be, uh, can be leaked and, uh, or can be uh, hacked by criminals and afterwards being shared throughout the internet without their knowledge. Uh, this we are we're talking about one out of two people has having this concern as we speak now in the EU. But on the contrary, there are fewer people who are co concerned about uh, having their data accessed by law enforcement agencies or their employers. Uh, the majority also of people in the EU, around 70%, know about uh, or at least report that they know about the privacy settings of their smartphones. However, less than half respondents actually uh, replied of, how, of knowing exactly privacy settings of individual apps and how to uh, set them up properly. Overall, uh, around equally a number of 70% uh, has replied of knowing and having heard about the general data protection regulation. So again, we are uh, talking that uh, we, uh, we are having, we're having one third of people who have never heard of the GDPR or have, have never had uh, any uh, interest of uh, finding out the existence of this important tool. Uh, also, similarly, uh, less, less than 70%, around the percent of 60% of people in the EU, 27 member states, are aware uh, of the right to access data. Uh, however, especially of the right to access data, their own personal data held by, by public administration or other public uh, uh, entities. However, this percentage decreases to 51% for private companies. So at the end, we have like less than half, around half people in the EU knowing the right, knowing that they have the right to access uh, their own personal data held by other entities, whether public or private. Uh, 71 and uh, around the same percentage, around 71 of the people in the EU have heard about their National Supervisory Authority for Data Protection, what we also call them, what we also refer to as data protection authorities. Uh, so we we have noticed that uh, there is a, a lack of a lack of knowledge uh, around the EU or, or from the, or the part of individuals about their own about the data protection uh, regime, and this of course raises a lot of issue of how we can uh, uh, of enforcing properly the rights in practice. Uh, also, in, this, in, this, in relation to uh, the conflict of uh, uh, rights, uh, we have touched upon this on our handbook on European uh, Data Protection Law, which was updated in 2018 to reflect the changes brought about the, by the GDPR and the Law Enforcement Directive. Uh, 
on the, on our health book we actually uh, describe how uh, the right to data protection it's a, is a right which inherently often interacts with other rights, especially such as the freedom of expression and the right to receive uh, uh, information. Uh, this interaction between personal data protection on the one hand and other rights on the other is ambivalent. Actually, there are situations where the right to da uh, personal data protection is at odds with another right, uh, but there, also, there are many situations where the right to personal data protection is applied together, naturally reinforces uh, protection of another right at the same time. For instance, this is the case of freedom of expression uh, on account of professional secrecy, uh, which is also a component of the right uh, to private life, personal data protection, as well to uh, freedom uh, to express one's own beliefs. Uh, the need to protect uh, the general data protection regulation also. Uh, what we have found is actually and this has been the first instrument that has done so, the General Data Protection Regulation actually defers to member states the reconciliation of uh, the right to personal data protection with the freedom of expression of information. This is the first instrument as a regulation that leaves a great margin of appreciation to member states to further regulate the, personal, the individual personal, uh, personal data protection rights found in the GDPR. And this especially regards uh, the balancing with the freedom of expression and information, with the right to public access to official documents and other obligations of professional secrecy. So therefore, although we are talking about the regulation, we see that the regulation itself leaves a lot of, mar a lot of uh, great margin to member states, national laws, to regulate these matters. So therefore, this again uh, comes back to uh, one of the main, uh, main arguments raised by the paper, that we have actually what we can call as uh, diverging and variable enforcement and uh, of fundamental rights in practice throughout the EU. Also, uh, we, uh, we as FRA has worked on, uh, on the, uh, we have issued the, a report on the surveillance by intelligence services, which actually was a two volume report, which dealt with, uh, with about uh, intelligence services and fundamental rights safeguards in the EU. This was a call, this was, report was a, an outcome of a call sent to us by the European Parliament following the Snowden revelations. Uh, now, on these reports, we actually have realized, we have found that uh, uh, throughout the EU, what has been a uh, great concern for all is that surveillance legislation is considered quite complex by, uh, by, inter, by, inter, by professionals and uh, other experts. And indeed, that a clear uh, legal framework would be much needed. And this comes again to argument to other uh, points raised by other discussers so far. Uh, also, what we have uh, what we have found based on the interviews we conducted with uh, professionals of the field is, is that there are quite many limits uh, to the independence of bodies that are actually oversight intelligence services. Uh, we have found that. Main, some bodies throughout the EU, I'm not talking, of course, about all EU member states, but selected member states, uh, and some oversight bodies do not have binding decision making power. So, actually, they can uh, send an opinion and send, uh, or, send, uh, uh, or uh, refer a complaint to uh, the intelligence service, but they actually have no powers of uh, making their opinion binding to such, uh, to such uh, services. Also, we see that we found that. Uh, indeed, a lot of oversight bodies of, uh, have limited staff and budget, which actually hardens uh, their work to uh, oversee how intelligence services actually comply with fundamental rights. Also, another issue that we have noticed is that uh, some oversight bodies have limited access to, special, to expert personnel and uh, have limited technical capacity that would allow them to uh, actually scrutinize uh, intelligence services and complete and uh, complete the role properly. Also, in, many, in some member states, such oversight bodies do not have access to classified data held by intelligence services. Uh, and this actually, again, uh, is a main obstacle to, uh, for the work to actually see how uh, intelligence services in practice protect fundamental rights. And often, quite often, we found that there are many limitations on the individuals themselves, on the right to be notified or the right to access their own data 
helped by, by such uh, intelligence services, which again, of course, makes any kind of scrutiny of personal data pro, uh, requirements quite a, a difficult task to, com to, uh, to complete in practice. And at this point, I would like to thank you and we'll, uh, continue with the discussion later. Um, I think the application to private citizens that you focused on in particular in the beginning of your presentation was a context that Lena mentioned as central to how she structured the paper. It puts data access into a very practical, practicable context, let's say, for us all. And GDPR, of course, the key Brussels effect uh, cornerstone piece of legislation from the last Commission mandate deferring to member states is something I'd definitely like to come back to on the remedy side and also in the COVID-19 setting. And moving back, in fact, to the healthcare and the pandemic, um, that brings us on to the last panelist who we've not yet heard from, which is Heidi. Um, Heidi, in your research work, you've thought too about how rights can coexist and looking specifically at enabling scientific research, which is something that Emma's mentioned too. And to create a good bridge, maybe from Alex's view just now, do you have any human rights and COVID measures perspectives to share? We've all been thinking, of course, about data flows during the global pandemic uh, and our own personal data, sensitive data. Um, so Heidi, how did you receive Lena's paper? And please tell us more about your views on collision of rights. Absolutely. Thank you so much for the invitation and for the opportunity to discuss these important issues here today. Uh, well, we are, of course, as you all know, in the midst of a pandemic, and you probably not noticed a lot of difficulties with data transfers, which is because they rely on an ex uh, exception now, a derogation for these types of emergency situations. However, medical research in general does not. And this is what I would like to focus on here today. Uh, modern medical research is highly data intensive, partly due to the mapping of the human genome that was achieved about 20 years ago combined with rapid technological advances, extreme cost reductions, and increased computing power, we are now able to conduct unprecedented medical research into rare diseases and subgroups of common diseases. We can also combine, for instance, genomic data with data generated through sensors and wearables and with health registries, where particularly the Nordic countries have magnificent registries spanning many decades. So in Europe, we are fortunate to have excellent researchers contributing to reach the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union aim of strengthening the EU's scientific and technological basis and becoming more competitive through free circulation of researchers, scientific knowledge and technology. The EU has therefore in that treaty declared that there should be as few legal obstacles to research collaboration as possible. So this is evident in, for instance, the EU GDPR, which is a regulation that is an example of a balancing act as indicated in its objectives, which are twofold. One is to ensure the necessary free movement of personal data. The other objective of the GDPR is to ensure the protection of personal data as enshrined in the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union. So the GDPR balances these two objectives, for instance, by providing myriad exemptions from the main rules, if the purpose of the data processing is scientific research, and most importantly of all, by increasing the legal harmonization in the data protection field in Europe, which helps facilitate the crucial data intensive international collaborations. Now, this is all well and good had it not been for the fact that Europe isn't big enough. When we study finer subgroups of common diseases, for instance, different types of breast cancer or rare disease, is where even, um, even if each rare disease only affects few people, the joint number of people affected by rare diseases is estimated to be between 27 and 36 million people in the EU alone. For these types of research, we need big data sets. A single country isn't big enough and the EU isn't big enough. We are dependent on global collaborations to obtain the necessary statistical power to draw valid scientific conclusions 
and to know if findings hold true also for the European population with its genetic makeup, lifestyle, and environmental factors. So this is where the problem unfortunately begins. As we saw from the Schrems II judgment, use of US electronic communication service providers became difficult. This includes US cloud providers, much used for data intensive medical research. The reason why this became difficult was, as many of you in this call know, that the companies are subject to US surveillance legislation, which the Court of Justice of the European Union found to be in violation of the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights, particularly the right to effective remedy and the right to data protection. We also, in medical research, experience halted data transfers to US federal institutions, uh, amongst others, and I will explain why later. But halted data transfers present such a grave threat to scientific advancement that the three European scientific academy networks, ALIA, ESAC, and FEM, which stand for the European Federation of Academies of Sciences and Humanities, European Academies Science Advisory Council, and the Federation of European Academies of Medicine, all came together for the first time to collaborate on this specific issue. The joint report was presented in April, and an article in Nature Medicine summing up the findings were published, uh, was published in August and both will be made available to you by Access Partnership after the event. I think I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you. Heidi, thank you. Um, and great to hear too more about the impact of the Schrems II judgments. We hear a lot about the need to fill this uh, legal void in the wake of the invalidation of the privacy shield, but I think you've really brought it to life with what it means for science. Um, fantastic. And I would like to hear from panelists again, actually, while we have the time, because Lena looked at the equilibrium of remedies as well as the balance of rights themselves. And though broadly speaking, we are talking about EU contexts here, um, as, as Heidi and others have brought up, um, this is clearly a global issue and it would be salient, we think, to look further at the national level where it starts and deep dive into fragmentation of national enforcement with some national case studies. We've already heard a bit about FinData, but there are more. Um, it'll also be ch a chance, however, for us speakers to react to each other's first expositions. So let's shake up the order of interventions too for this second round, uh, balancing this array of multidisciplinary input in every way possible. Uh, mindful of time, so maybe we'll be slightly more succinct for this round to be sure to leave plenty of time for Q&A. Um, Emma, over to you first this time. Great, thank you. Um, I wanted to uh, kind of reply to some of what Jan had mentioned in his opening comment, um, particularly about sort of algorithmic control and enforcement of, of laws um, and how I see that linking to a real trend in EU policymaking um, in the, the tech sector in particular, which has been to kind of put in my view, to put more and more of these decisions about balancing fundamental rights actually on the shoulders of the tech companies themselves um, and kind of put uh, companies in the position of trying to do this way and to try to do this balancing. Um, I think some of this comes from the fact that these are on the one hand very difficult questions, but that there is this really um, often kind of challenging technical underpinning to some of these questions. And it can mean that the instinct is that, you know, at a certain point, the deliberation stops and the answer is, well, the companies will have to figure this out and, and we'll have to resolve the solution. So Jan mentioned already the um, the case of Maria Costeja Gonzalez, the, the right to be forgotten case, um, or otherwise known as the Google Spain case back from 2014. Uh, and in that case, um, the, the court found that EU citizens had a right to request um, that a search engine like Google no longer process data pertaining to them where it was out of date or irrelevant or no longer relevant. Uh, and because of in a large part because of the posture of the case going um, going before the court, the court really primarily looked at the, the privacy and dignity rights of Mr. Costeja Gonzalez and the kind of business interest rights of Google um, and didn't really consider the 
speech rights of the newspaper that had originally written the article about Mr. Jose Gonzalez's debts um, that was actually required by law to be published in newspapers in Spain back in um, when it had originally been published. Uh, and it didn't really consider the access to information rights of the people who would want to read that information. Um, and, and crucially, it left Google with the task of figuring out how to develop a process for implementing this right to uh, of individuals to ask that content be delinked from search results pertaining to their name. Google actually stood up a whole sort of global consultation process and and developed um, you know a whole set of procedures around how it was going to kind of take in these requests and evaluate them. Um, but it was at the time I think fairly shocking to a lot of us that there was that much sort of leeway and responsibility put on a private company to to do the weighing of what was essentially the privacy rights of an individual and the access to information and speech rights of hundreds or thousands or even millions of, of other internet users. Um, and I see, unfortunately, some of these same threads of kind of putting companies in the position of making determinations of law and making determinations of the application of people's fundamental rights, uh, still per, uh, persisting in the DSA conversations. I see this most directly in Article 14, which is the core notice and action provision for the Digital Services Act. This is the, um, the, the element that says there is a safe harbor from liability unless upon actual knowledge uh, of illegal content on their services, an intermediary fails to take action against that content. Um, I'm paraphrasing here, but uh, one of the, the main features of Article 14 in the, the proposed Digital Services Act is that these notifications about illegal content are able to come from pretty much anyone, not only from a court, which makes sense and, and, and is appropriate, um, but also potentially from law enforcement actors who are not actually equipped or, um, or authorized to make final determinations of the legality of someone's speech. They might come from entities called trusted flaggers, uh, which are often nonprofit organizations that have some specialty in fighting things like illegal hate speech or hate and discrimination in general, but again, are not courts able to make a final determination of illegality of speech or just from regular users. And we know from many decades of content moderation that regular users and, and lots of other folks will abuse notice and takedown processes to try to target speech that they disagree with. But in the current draft of the DSA, notice from any of these kinds of notifiers would defeat the safe harbor protection, would have the intermediary considered to have actual knowledge of illegal content and start the whole process rolling of incentives for the company to take more aggressive action against content that has been notified, you know, err on the side of, con uh, of caution in taking down or restricting access to content. Um, there's also a very kind of uh, troubling out of court dispute settlement body proposal in the DSA. This is in Article 18. Um, and it essentially, it's in a way, it sounds almost like something like the Facebook Oversight Board or some other kind of independent entity that could hear complaints from users, from individuals whose content has been taken down, or from users perhaps who, whose notifications have gone unresponded to, where content wasn't taken down when they, they notified the company of it, um, to send to some, some third body that wasn't the company itself for a kind of review of that appeal. When we're talking about issues of terms of service enforcement, of kind of community guidelines enforcement, where the question is not a matter of law, a body like that might be uh, actually a benefit or at least a potentially a utility to the individual who is not getting an appeal um, you know, directly from the company or, or wants some other set of evaluation to happen. But currently in the DSA, those out of court dispute settlement bodies would also be making decisions about um, removals that the companies have made on the basis that the content was illegal. So essentially setting up an explicitly out of court decision-making body to determine whether a company had accurately decided whether someone's speech is illegal. This is, in my view, kind of piling more problematic uh, process on top of a, a core kind of flawed concept that companies can, in fact, make determinations of whether someone has violated the law. Um, and as a matter of appeal rights for an individual to only have this kind of private body um, or a private company as the venue for your appeal when you think your fundamental rights have been violated, that your fundamental right to free expression has been violated by 
a company deciding your speech was illegal, that seems wholly insufficient for, for protection of fundamental rights. Um, so I'll stop there, but uh, happy to, to dig into this more and looking forward to hearing from everyone else. Interests of time and moving swiftly on, I'll come to Heidi. Findata case. What happened in Finland was that when revising their law, not only did they ensure GDPR compliance, but they added stricter rules due to a Finnish constitutional focus on self-determination. And we see similar examples in all EU countries. The countries act as their own worst enemies by adding national legislation on top of EU legislation, which create unnecessary obstacles to free movement of data. When conducting a medical research project, it does make it more difficult when, for instance, the GDPR states that it only applies to living individuals, while, for instance, Denmark adds a rule that it also applies 10 years after someone's death. Those types of legal fragmentations make collaborations more difficult than they ought to be. Still, our main challenge in medical research is not the EU countries, their laws or balancing of rights done in the EU. One of the main research funders in the world is the US National Institutes of Health. There are currently about 5,000 collaborative projects sponsored by the NIH between the EU and the US. Data transfers in these projects are halted, for instance, stalling important cancer research projects. The reason is that US federal institutions are protected by sovereign immunity, meaning that they do not ensure enforceable data subject rights and effective legal remedies for European research participants. Uh, they do uh, ensure this for US research participants. This makes it difficult to establish an appropriate safeguard for the data uh, transfer as required under EU data protection law. Medical research requires processing of individual level health and genetic data on a large scale and is dependent on public trust, meaning that researchers are very concerned with respecting research participants' rights. The data is always pseudonymized. Privacy enhancing technologies are used where feasible to protect research participants and federated analyses or meta-analysis of country-specific results are run where the aim of the research can be achieved in that manner. Unfortunately, privacy enhancing technologies are great, but only get us so far. We also often need to conduct actual data transfers. And the issue we are currently faced with is that while the EU has managed to achieve a proper coexistence of fundamental rights here, we are not always seeing the same in other important collaborating countries. As mentioned, there are derogations in place that allow data transfers during a pandemic. However, the use of these derogations failed to adequately protect the rights of the data subject and therefore does not represent a sustainable solution for medical research in general. Aliyah, Isak, and Fim note in their report an article that the GDPR has become a privacy standard other countries seek to follow, which really gives EU an important role in the global discussion on privacy and the necessity of data sharing for health research for the benefit of society. So this places the EU in a position to exert pressure on other countries to reform their regulation to enable reciprocity in privacy enhanced data sharing. For this data sharing to happen, the EU must then work with other countries to resolve statutory conflicts, but this will of course also require cooperation from those countries. So what researchers need are for rights to coexist, but not for one to be dominant. Thank you. Thank you so much, Heidi. Um, and this notion of reciprocity uh, too, which uh, I think is really important in this context. Moving swiftly on, Alex, uh, it would be great to come to you again, please. Um, understanding also that the FRA has some findings on national member state measures in the COVID-19 context. Thank you. Uh, yes, indeed. Throughout the uh, during the past few uh, during the past year uh, and in, 20, in June 2020, we we as FRA. Uh, have delivered uh, the COVID-19 bulletin reports, uh, which were monthly reports on the situation of uh, fundamental uh, measures of impacting on fundamental rights, measures relating to, to the pandemic. Uh, and we've seen there that um, 
especially with data protection, uh, data protection issues, we've seen that member states have uh, differently have uh, developed dif quite different approaches, quite diverging approaches uh, with regard to personal data and how they were using them. For example, we've seen that uh, uh, a lot of a lot of uh, some states, uh, not a considerable number of states actually, were using also. Uh, tracking applications that is that is tracking individuals their whereabouts through mobile phones and through cellular in, through the uh, through cell networks to uh, see whether particular individuals have actually uh, breached the car their individual quarantine measures uh, we have seen also that uh, while in other member states uh, such a such an idea was considered uh, totally unthinkable. We've seen that it did in some, in some member states has been materialized. Also, with regard to, uh, for example, uh, distance learning. Uh, there we've seen also national DPAs, national data protection authorities, developing, developing uh, diverging approaches on the, on the standards that are required for the, uh, such distant learning for kids uh, that are at school, and also for the uh, for the lawfulness of such uh, measures, uh, also that we have seen that we also with regard to drone surveillance, uh, for example in in, Fran in, uh, in France, uh, drone surveillance for COVID for complying with COVID nineteen social uh, social uh, distance rules. Uh, has been challenged that the constitution called uh, the constitution, constitution called struck down the legislation while in other member states such drone surveillance was uh, conducted every day and uh, there were no challenges at all being brought uh, at a uh, judicial or at a DP, uh, the in before national dpas uh, indeed uh, we we see that around the euro we do talk about uh, everybody is talking about the gdpr about a common issue that we have, but uh, there are many factors that are indeed, uh, uh, in practice, make this this kind of personal data protection in real life quite diverging for individuals throughout the EU. We have variable levels uh, the, the, of awareness of individuals across EU member states on the general uh, on personal data protection legislation. We have also different legal provisions enacted nationally based on the GDPR. Coupled to that, we have diverging interpretations and applications between uh, DPAs, not often, but we do have those. And also, we have different, uh, we have uh, different speeds, uh, different capacities for such uh, watchdogs. We see that uh, there are uh, such watchdogs have different competence, have different restrictions, and limitations around the EU. So, indeed, at the end, uh, I believe we are talking quite. In, in a, we are uh, discussing for a, about a very fragmented uh, landscape that um, impacts on uh, on uh, EU citizens in practice. Thank you very much, Alex. It's really interesting to hear about uh, measures linked to, for example, distance learning, which is something we think of as, as quite soft and then juxtaposed with drone surveillance, which seems much more sort of uh, hard and concrete and, and interventionist. Um, very interesting overview. Thank you so much. I'd just like to remind uh, viewers that you can submit questions to RSVP at accesspartnership.com with the subject line webinar. Um, and there is one which, as I segue into Jan, who still needs to react here, I would just invite all speakers to consider responding to if they're aware. So one, one viewer asks whether, um, whether speakers are aware of any new initiative in any member state to address the issue of data sharing or access to data. Um, and without further ado, uh, so speakers invited to think about that. Uh, let me come to Jan, um, who I know would like to talk about national hate speech law examples. And, and also, Jan, the opportunity here to react to some of what the other speakers have said and responded uh, when you outlined your vision there of the future of tech law and auto enforcement. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lara. It's, it's fantastic to be part of this panel. And I'm afraid I would have a lot to say, a lot to comment, a lot to ask from the other speakers. But mindful of the time, I keep myself, I keep myself very brief. But I hope we will get back to these questions and comments in our Q&A session in a moment. Allow me just to add one additional layer of complexity to our discussion that dovetails with, with what Alex just, just um, 
refer to. We are mostly talking about harmonization. We're talking about the GDPR, the Digital Services Act, the Digital Single Market uh, Directive. But I would like to take another look from a slightly different perspective. At one conference, one of my colleagues coined the wonderful sentence, harmonization is boring. Harmonization is boring. To put this in, in slightly more, more serious language, I'm not sure to what extent harmonization via the EU is always the solution to all the problems, all the challenges we are facing, including in the online environment. So in other words, isn't a certain level of fragmentation even necessary to consider certain sensitivities, historical, cultural sensitivities of the member states? Because after all, law is nothing but codified policy. The law is the codification of an idea. And I'm wondering, does the European Union always have better ideas than the member states themselves? So just to refer to two examples where we can see a certain divergence relates precisely to hate speech laws. And we know hate speech is a very sensitive matter, but we also know that there are national sensitivities in particular with regard to, to specific forms of, of hate speech. So by way of example, we do observe the so-called Network Enforcement Act operating in Germany, not to everyone's pleasure, but nevertheless, it by and large seems to work. At least it is an operation. We are still awaiting a final decision at some point, at least by the Constitutional Court. But nevertheless, it is an action and it has even been revised a couple of times. So that's the sort of German perspective on the issue of fragmentation, now with regard in particular to hate speech. But then again, there was an approach, a similar approach in, in, in France, the Loi Avia, and this has been struck down by the Conseil Constitutionnel. So we see again a certain sensitivity with regard to hate speech here from the French perspective, and at the same time, a balancing exercise that has been conducted by the Conseil with the outcome that this, that this Loi, that this act has largely been struck down. Yeah? This is probably something heretical to say for an EU lawyer, but nevertheless, I am questioning, I am asking, does the European Union really provide the solutions to all the problems that we are facing? Or shouldn't we actually allow the law to develop incrementally to let member states take their own approaches to specific subjects and then essentially, essentially see what happens, keep the good results, abandon the bad results, the bad approaches. Um, something I would just like to put in into the discussion, to what extent is harmonization actually necessary and to what extent is a certain level of, of fragmentation among the member states even beneficial. Now I look forward to the questions and to the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jan, also for introducing that cultural context, uh, culture being, of course, a member state competence, yet underpinning still um, many tech laws, actually. It's it's very, and, and media laws, of course, um, it's, it's very interesting to hear about that key differentiation built in. I mean, while I have you on the screen, um, maybe as we go into Q&A, I can put the first question to you. Um, and there's one here on how might policy makers address this imbalance whereby data protection has a dedicated EU law and a supervisory authority at the administrative level, as opposed to other fundamental rights and freedoms that have not been developed through equivalent laws, such as freedom of expression. Should other fundamental rights have a dedicated administrative supervisory authority to protect them? Jan, what are your views on this question? Thank you very much. A wonderful, a wonderful question. And I have a straightforward answer to this question. My, my answer to this is no. Especially as far as freedom of expression is concerned, I am very careful about the idea of a public authority enforcing, supervising, regulating, however you like to call it, freedom of expression. It's meant as a good idea, it is meant to support freedom of expression, but my understanding about freedom of expression is in particular the underlying idea of a certain suspicion of government. Yeah? So freedom of expression, the idea of freedom of speech derives from the natural law theory, the idea that there are certain rights that we have that operate outside the state, outside the public community. So this is a rather ancient liberty that we are aware of. I'm very, very wary about the idea that there should be public authorities now um, 
uh, sort of acting as a public watchdog on freedom of expression in particular. No, there's something else I would, I would like to suggest. Of course, data protection authorities, they make, they make an excellent job, but perhaps the terminology is a bit unfortunate. It, it might actually indicate a certain, perhaps certain bias, a certain inclination towards protecting personal data rather than conflicting interests. And perhaps that's something we might want to take on board, the idea that it is not just the task of data protection authorities to protect personal data, which is a very recent idea, very recent fundamental right that has been developed, but also, but also conflicting interests. Ultimately, and this again, I think, builds the bridge to the discussion we had previously about for whom is actually to enforce these rights, for whom is it to conduct these balancing exercise. My answer is also, also clear and straightforward. It's for the courts. It's for the courts. They have the tools available. They know what they have to do. They know how to operate with freedom of expression. They also know how to operate uh, with data protection. I think this is good as it is. Thank you so much, Jan. Um, we have a second question here, and I'm, I'm thinking Heidi would be well placed to take it in the first instance, seeing as it's about research. Welcome back, Heidi. Um, I was just wondering, could you give a concrete case where you know of research having been stalled or blocked due to legal requirements? Well, I, I, I can give you many examples. Uh, as mentioned, there are about 5,000 collaborative projects between the USNIH and EEA countries that are affected, and that's just the ones that the NIH has sponsored. At least 40 clinical and observational studies on risk factors and exposures for cancers uh, ha have been suspended or delayed because of the current legal challenges. Uh, multiple research projects within the National Cancer Institute Cohort Consortium, where cohort uh, studies from all over the world participate, have also been suspended or delayed as the European participating studies cannot proceed with data transfers. Uh, the World Health Organization's International Agency for Research on Cancer has been negatively affected as it cannot receive research data for um, collaborating European uh, studies. So those are some examples. Thank you so much, Heidi. And Emma, I'm aware that in your interventions, you gave many research focused examples too. just wondering whether you'd have anything to add here. Yes, yes, I can add um, one. It was fairly high profile example uh, that, that played out in the United States and a good example of how legal uncertainty can also be a block to research. Um, and this was with the NYU Ad Observatory uh, app. So this is the um, New York University Ad Observatory uh, program, which enabled people to um, install a, uh, a browser plugin, I believe, so that they could be donating data from their own use of Facebook um, to a repository that enabled more kind of analysis and evaluation of Facebook ad targeting um, and uh, information about what was going on on the Facebook platform. Um, Facebook in August of this year uh, blocked the NYU ad observatory app um, from operation and actually disabled the accounts of the lead researchers um, and argued that they had to do so because of a, a Federal Trade Commission consent decree around user privacy that Facebook has been bound by um, for, for many years. Uh, Facebook was saying that they were concerned about the kinds of information that might be sort of re-identified to individuals, including Facebook's own um, uh, assessment and kind of uh, inferred characteristics about individuals that Facebook then allows advertisers to target on. Um, and so they they had, I think, a, a a description of a technical issue that they were concerned about, that by combining several data sets, the one data that Facebook made available, but also the one that um, NYU was collecting from individuals, that uh, a nefarious researcher could kind of conclude more information about specific individuals who'd been shown an ad that Facebook had sort of inferred about them in a way that jeopardized those people's privacy. Um, but the way Facebook kind of rolled this out, they they actually had a, a public letter back from the FTC saying that is not how we understand the consent decree to apply, um, kind of a don't look at us, we're not the ones standing in the way of research. Um, but to my knowledge, the, the NYU Ad Observatory app is still blocked. And I think it, it sort of jeopardizes the potential for a lot of other kinds of interventions like this, if it is not 
clear to the companies and if it's not if there's not a clear legal framework under which research can or even must be able to be conducted on private data um, because when there is a lot of uncertainty i think we see time and again tech companies responding from a posture of legal risk is something to be minimized to the greatest extent possible um, and that can end up shutting down um, really important and interesting uh, avenues for research Thank you so much, Emma, um, and interesting avenues for research, though I think we've also opened some up with this discussion. Uh, let's continue. I think we would have time for one more question, and I'm thinking about whether there might be any cases currently under scrutiny where freedom of speech or freedom of expression can be seen in conflict with the protection of data. I mean, maybe, Alex, we haven't heard from you yet on a question, and from the FRA angle, this could be really interesting. Over to you. Hello. Well, uh, the, uh, so far, I, uh, I'm not aware of any concrete cases uh, that came abroad in the court of justice of the EU. But indeed, this is a uh, uh, the conflict between personal data protection and uh, freedom of expression is indeed a quite uh, vi live one. Uh, we we see that, uh, for example, uh, in our reports on the, uh, the fundamental rights agency, we issued a report on the presumption of innocence and uh, other related rights based on the director. And then we, we analyzed how the issue of uh, the journalistic freedom and the right to uh, provide information to the public about ongoing trials at criminals may quite often compete with the right to personal data protection and the privacy of persons that are involved in such proceedings as either defendants or victims. So uh, it's something that did happen throughout Europe in uh, almost everyday life at the courts, uh, where journalists very heavily report on, uh, uh, on ongoing cases, but uh, the reporting may also touch upon uh, sensitive issues, uh, sensitive uh, personal data of the victim or of, uh, of the defendant it's, uh, himself. Indeed, this is a quite delicate balancing exercise uh, it depends on the facts of the case. There cannot be any uh, uh, solution, any catch-all solution for such cases. And one has to see the has has to see the, the individuals. And there has been also, I can recall that there, there has been also a case at the Court of Justice of the EU. I cannot recall the name of the case now, but there was this case where uh, a guy was arrested by the police. And uh, while he was arrested, he uh, he took video footage of the police officers who were who uh, while they were uh, performing the tasks of arresting and you know uh, uh, putting down uh, the records of the arrested so on and so forth. And he later on he published this video uh, to the in his personal blog site. So the question came to the court of justice whether this guy could actually uh, be be considered as acting as a journalist, although he was not a journalist, he was an individual person. And the court of judges actually replied that since, and then we had again the conflict between one on the personal data of the police officer who was who were taking the video footage and their privacy, and on the other hand, the right to express oneself freely of the, for, uh, as regards the guy who actually, the person who uploaded the video footage. And the court of justice replied in this case uh, that, uh, uh, in order to invoke freedom of expression, one has not must not be a journalist himself, but he should be acting in order to inform the public. And in, the, in this case, since the video footage was taken, or uh, the video footage of police officers regarded only the acts acts that that they were conducting in their official public capacity as police officers. Uh, and uh, the intention and the, the intention of the of the person who uploaded the video was to inform the public. The court of justice in this occasion held in favor of the freedom of expression and not on the not on the privacy and the personal data protection of the police officers at hand. So again, I mean something that it comes it, it is a quite often case. No, very, very clear and again, very practical uh, example. Uh, thank you very much, Alex. Uh, Jan, I think you might have had a view on this question too. Yes, absolutely. And it fits to, to what Alex just described. It's not just cases pending about these questions. Now, of course, cases still at the lower instances, but they are happening. No, it's actually a trend that we observe. It is. And 
Uh, there's something new going on. So say some 20, 20, 30 years ago when I studied the law, the question was about privacy, the question was about reputation, so we balance privacy or reputation with freedom of expression. Arguably the most famous case then of course was the 2004 decision by the European Court of Human Rights von Hannover versus Germany by way of example. And this has changed. Copyright or data protection has become the new defamation, the new privacy law the new law to vindicate a person's reputation, as has been the case, for example, in the Buivitz decision that Alex just, just referred to. Some 20, 30 years ago, courts would have now have conducted this balancing exercise of the conflicting interests, German courts operating under the general personality right and now conduct, conducting this delicate balancing exercise. Now with copyright and data protection, we have a much sharper sword at our disposal, or claimants do, and this is why claimants, this is why, why cases now often operate rather than under personality rights, they operate under copyright or they operate under, under data protection. Yeah, copyright cases, very recent copyright case in this regard, for example, there's the Spiegel Online case or the Funke Media case where people actually try to protect information because they were personal or because they were they were secret, they were confidential, but they tried to protect this information because it was copyright protected or because they claimed that it was copyright protected. And we see similar things now going on in, in, in the realm of personal data, that uh, persons bring lawsuits against the journalistic media, not in the old fashioned way, by way of defamation or by way of privacy claims, but by arguing, you violate my personal data. Please delete this information about me, erase that information about me, rectify this in information about me because it's my, it's my personal data. I must admit it's a trend that I, not, I cannot fully appreciate because I think, again, it undermines this delicate balancing exercise between freedom of expression and reputation or privacy. But nevertheless, that's the trend that is currently going on. And I think I'm sure we will see much, much more about this in the future. Thank you so much, Jan. Really interesting overview of some of the relevant jurisprudence and, and also flagging just how delicate this balancing act is. I think we might have time, Heidi, for really a one minute um, overview from you, as I know you wanted to react to a couple of comments. If you could be very succinct, I'd be so grateful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Alex said that the GDPR defers to EU member states to balance rights. And Jan said maybe fragmentation is good. But legal fragmentation is not helpful for medical research where we need to combine data from all member states and also transfer data to third countries. We witness the same problem in the US now, which is highly concerning. Single US states issue their own data protection legislation due to the lack of proper federal legislation. And this may leave us with 50 different laws to take into consideration when collaborating with the US, which makes those collaborations even more challenging. And Jan for, further focus on CODA's law, and we recently reviewed the 5,000 papers published on health data governance the past three years in the world. We noticed a clear trend towards tech governance, where governance is no longer lawyers and ethicists' domain, but technologists. And finally, may I just add that Emma asked who is a researcher, and without a definition of scientific research, there is, of course, a risk of unethical practices. So we have, or I have conducted a thorough review of jurisprudence from the Court of Justice of the European Union and the European Court of Human Rights to see which criteria the courts use to assess what constitutes scientific research. Those are four criteria. And the former United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Right to Privacy, Joe Canatacci, subsequently included these four elements in the definition of scientific research in the global recommendation on the protection and use of health-related data. So you can find them there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Heidi. And I know we were hoping to get to sort of ways forward, but I actually think in particular the second round and Q&A and some of these wrap up comments uh, where we've summarized trends and started to think about ways forward. We've really covered that. Thank you so much. Lena, um, you've I think had very rich inputs on your paper, which clearly did springboard some very uh, comprehensive conversations across disciplines. Over to you for some key takeaways and wrap up comments as author of our paper. And thank you again so much uh, for this really important work, which we.
maybe I will just start uh, with what Jan kind of said and some others echoed that the legal fragmentation is not good for anyone, not the citizens, not the organizations, maybe just for the lawyers. Um, and that uh, is not the sufficient reason to have that. Kind of the those who have heard me before know that I keep repeating that the whole idea of having a legal systems and rules in place is that I could understand the consequences of my choices and then I would have a sufficient enforcement backing me up against those who do not respect that. Um, and also maybe uh, repeating that I also personally kind of um, dislike the idea that we would have very fragmented approach for the enforcement as well and kind of separate bodies protecting separate rights uh, because I mean in this case uh, A, these rights uh, could be kind of in conflict, but in the next case B, they may be supporting each other because they are so intertwined. And uh, I would like to um, then make a wish. It's a holiday season, so I have uh, two sincere wishes. Um, first of all, of course, I hope that this um, there would be sufficient remedies, of course, for the citizens, and there would be legal certainty for each stakeholders. But second, and maybe more importantly, specifically uh, hearing this, where we have very different views, and that's something I do like, because I want to have discussions. I'm afraid that sometimes we have these fighting lines, as I say, that do not talk with each other, but we are all operating in the same world and in the same ecosystems. So I do hope that this debate and discussion from these points has only just started and will continue and we will be listening to each other to try to find out together the best solutions to bring that certainty and maybe remove the fragmentation. So let's breathe, break those front lines and let's keep discussing. Thank you. I mean, Lena, thank you so much. And I noticed you quoted in your paper that George Orwell has been quoted uh, ad nauseam on different levels of equality, but we can agree indeed, as you elaborated, that the interplay between multiple fundamental rights as an under-discussed angle to the data protection sphere. And it's really been my honor to have been invited to facilitate such a tour de force of some of the most cogent questions around the impact of technology and society that we face today. Very, very many thanks to Access Partnership technicians for keeping the show on the road and to Lena Kusniemi and Lydia Detling in particular for their consistency and thoughtfulness in thinking through all the details to help us pull together the wisdom and insights of our truly excellent speakers, Heidi Benson, Jan Oster, Emma Lanzo, and Alex Kargopoulos. All Access Partnership activities, including the paper we've discussed today and notes, plus a recording of this webinar, will be available on accesspartnership.com and Access Partnerships YouTube channel. So very many thanks once again for joining us this afternoon and staying with us. All the best from me and have a great evening.